we now invite you to a special format featuring a narrative approach. Please enjoy Stories of Democratization, chaired by Gita Hermann. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gita Hermann, and I welcome you to the session Stories of Democratization. In this format, we are going to look at very personal stories of democratization, and I'm really, really looking forward to the two speakers we are going to talk to today. Um, we have this one session today, and then tomorrow we are going to have another session um, at one, which will be offline. Um, and just for context, I would like to start with the idea of of this format. We just wanted to talk and personalize stories of democratization because sometimes we we think of democracy as a very political and straightforward and theoretical um, approach, but actually there are so many personal biographies that are touched by democratization and we really wanted to give that some room. And we got some very diverse and interesting voices for that format and I'm very, very happy to introduce the first speaker of today's session, which is Julia Tsimefieva, who is a poet from Belarus. And she will tell us about her own experience in the movement um, and in her activist life. Um, she is currently in Georgia at the International Literature Festival. And we are very happy to be able to talk to you online and I now give the floor to you. Welcome, Julia. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Gita. Uh, 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 yes, my name is Julia Tmafieva and I come from Belarus. I don't know whether all of you know that uh, uh, last year in 2020, we had uh, rigged elections after which uh, there was a very very brutal wave of violence from uh, the state side towards the peaceful protesters. And uh, my husband, uh, writer, Alger Bakharevich, and me uh, also took part in these uh, protests, in these events. And after that, as a result of that, I wrote a book uh, that is called Minsk Diary. It uh, has never been published in English, though it was written in English, actually. Though it's not my mother tongue at all, but that was the only way for me to write that book in that language. And the book was published in Swedish uh, as uh, Dagere Belarus, but also uh, in German like Minsk Tagebuch. So it's the full version of that. And uh, uh, I'm going to speak uh, about that book and about my, my experience. And I prepared a kind of essay that I would like to read aloud to you. Um, when you read books about revolutions or some turbulent times, you do not think about body. In the textbooks, it is mostly about ideas or dates or places or names, many complicated names. Sometimes these textbooks mention texts written, manifests or poems or big, thick works that accompany or anticipate those crucial events. But when you become the one who is inside that troubled revolutionary time, when the stun grenades are blowing up on your street or even under your feet, you realize the presence of your body in that very period of time very vividly. You feel how vulnerable you are in spite of all your education and quick mind. Your body becomes the main receiver of the changes. In the streets of the unlawful state, your body becomes the main prey for the human hunters in police uniform or plain clothes. When you have a body, you can be caught, you can be beaten, you can be killed. And at the same time, when you have a body, you can chant, you can march, and you can run as quick as possible. We run and run as everybody around us does. Young and old, women and men, workers and students, doctors and programmers. It doesn't matter who you are at the moment. The most important thing is how fast you can run from the police across the playgrounds, across the parking lots, between the apartment blocks with the doorways open by their compassionate dwellers. I write that in my Minsk diary. 
When I start working at that book that began from a NASA in Financial Times and the first variation, variant of which was published in Swedish as Dagger in Belarus and then appeared in full in German as Minsk Tagebuch, I realized that I wanted to tell not about ideas that pushed Belarusians and me to the streets to protest, these ideas were quite simple, but about the feelings and small everyday errands that are usually omitted in the textbooks about revolutions, especially in Belarusian, especially in Belarusian school textbooks. In Minsk Diaries, the main characters, my husband, Raita Alger Baharevich and me, are portrayed neither as heroes of the protests nor as their victims. We are common people who are afraid and disgusted, who run from the police, cry from despair and drink alcohol to relax. Actually, in my book, I was trying to show that the life of Belarusian writers is not so much different from my foreign colleagues. It is an emotional account that shows from within what it means to live in a cruel state in cruel times, to be human in the last dictatorship of Europe. The first version of Minsk Tagebuch starts on the 5th of August 2020, just a few days before the rigged presidential elections, at our small kitchen in Minsk apartment, where I'm cooking a soup, stroking a cat, waiting for my husband home, and composing a poem about fear and hope, an English language poem for the first time in my life. And it ends with an entry on the 2nd of April 2020, in Graz, where we were invited as participants of Writers in Exile program. I described how I twice buzzed my head to get some control, at least of my body, when I could not have any control of what was going on in my home country. But what is in between these two bodies that are both mine? There's of hope and despair, there's of action and and inaction, days and nights of unknowing what is going to happen next. In the first month of the protest, we were on the emotional roller coaster that took us high and filled with the euphoric feeling of victory and happy life ahead. And then suddenly we were put down. We shivered with fear that all of us will be arrested and shot dead. Just after the elections, I was unable to write neither poetry nor prose. I could not find the proper language, at least to describe, if not to analyze what was going on with us. I felt that the most important thing was to take part physically in the protest, to be with my people, to use the language of the body. Pictures and videos became the most important in these first days. Those of people inspired and inspiring the streets, their faces bright, their raised hands showing victory, their proud bodies in white cloaks. And then we saw other pictures. Dreadful pictures of injured and humiliated bodies of Akrestina and other detention centers prisoners. Their black eyes full of unspeakable terror, their brutally beaten and broken limbs. And there were also their stories about torture and rape, about torment and humiliation, and I was speechless, like many others. When during one of the peaceful demonstrations in November, my brother Petro sent me an SMS, taken, me. My first SMS to him was, have you been beaten? He answered, not yet. And I breathed out with relief. Though the horrible picture of him lying on the police van floor in blood, still occupied my imagination. He was lucky then. We were, we were lucky. The next day he was found guilty of taking part in an authorized event and released with a fine. There were too many people taken by the police for the detention centers to accommodate. I write about that in my Minsk diary. But nine months later, he was arrested again together with his wife and other 14 people that were celebrating a birthday of the front woman of Irdarat music group at her summer house. They were arrested by the masked men who were shooting their guns into the air. There is a video filmed by the police, how my brother and his friends are lying with their stomachs and faces on the ground and their hands chained behind their backs. Six of them, including Petro and his wife, all musicians have been jailed for criminal investigation for two and a half months now. 
The first 10 days of the imprisonment, they spent in awful conditions, sleeping without mattresses or linen on their prison beds. They were not given their puzzles with the underwear or socks or toothbrushes. They were not taken to shower or for a short walk. Now, they face up to four years in prison for playing music at the August protest last year in Minsk. For their bodies, their voices, their breath filling the bagpipes they were playing were present there. When I have breakfast or lunch, when I walk freely along beautiful grass streets or fly to other cities and countries, like Georgia, when I look at the sunset or foggy mountains, when I hug my husband, I think how my little brother and his tiny but strong wife live inside of their narrow prison cells, separated from each other, unable not only to hold hands, but even to share a few written lines. They wanted, but didn't manage to leave the country. It was too late. I often must ask myself why those who are under the threat of arrest do not leave. Journalists, human rights defenders, doctors or teachers or actors fired because of their views on the state politics. They have bodies that can be arrested and put into prison. They have bodies that could be tortured or murdered. And one of the answers I got from Belarusian philosopher Tatiana Shitsova, who was reluctant to leave Belarus and did it only a month ago. Recently, she has written in her social media account, the fact that you are there in Belarus and you do not hide your civic engagement is perceived as an important input. Your body, your physical presence, as if says, here I am and I'm against. I know what she's speaking about, but from the other side. Being not in Belarus for many months, I have felt the urge to feel the absence of my body in the country with words, with poems, prose. I wrote the full version of Min's diary in Graz, with interviews. As my body is granted safety, I try to speak loudly for those who are kept in captivity, like my brother and almost a thousand of other political prisoners, or for those who have chosen to stay in the country, but can't afford raising their voice too high. Thank you. That is... Thank you very much, Julia, for this very intense essay. Um, we might all need some time to process, um, but I do have a question that was in my mind the entire time when you were talking. Um, and it was the question, it, when, when I first read about inocracy and the idea of inocracy and the concept behind it, um, it, and it also says it on the website, that for more and more people, the future is no longer a promise, but a threat, and that they feel a sense of powerlessness. And this inocracy tries to put something against this. From all that you say, I do feel when I hear your words, I feel this sense of powerlessness in the absence of not being there. And, and still I also hear your strength and your power of really finding a way of approaching it and keeping on fighting. Um, what is your take on the future as a threat what do you what is your how do you feel about that how do you how do you relate to that and what do you put against it um um i was asked, so i yesterday gave an interview and there was a question whether i'm afraid that uh, my country could be um uh, taken by russia that it can be uh, a part, made a part a part of russia and I said that I'm more afraid for my brother and those who are in prison, who can be, uh, who can die of COVID, for example, if not be murdered by the state. So I think that uh, on the one hand, I feel, of course, this powerlessness also, maybe not because uh, many other people in the Western Europe, in the Central Europe feel, but uh, I said that I can't do much uh, about what my country is going through and I can't uh, do much for those who are in prison but on the other hand it also gives me that um, 
um, that strength that you are speaking about, that I have to uh, find that power still. I can't, um, I can't just sit and decide that uh, I can't change anything. That's why I won't change anything. No, I, I find uh, that hope I speak uh, in my book about, and I speak in my European poem about, um, hope for those who can't say anything and can't uh, do even less than we can do who are imprisoned. So for their sake, uh, we should find the ways, we should find that strength, we should not be uh, depressed. Uh, or, and if we are, then we should cure ourselves and go further, I think. So um, we should do what we can for those who can't do anything at all, I think. That's my uh, recipe, I guess, for, for this uh, problem or this issue. Yeah. It's definitely very inspiring to hear. Um, and I have one drive. more, so because I, I have to think. And also, of course, now I'm living uh, not in Belarus. I uh, left Belarus in, uh, at the, uh, in the end of November 2020. So I haven't seen my parents uh, 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 in, re in, in real life, uh, let's say, for almost a year, and my brother and my sister and so on and so forth. So, and my friends that stay in Belarus and uh, uh, coming back to Belarus is also one of the things that uh, gives me that power to do something for the changes in my own country. So now I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe also about the parents. Uh, when you were mentioning uh, your parents, I was thinking because you write that your parents have repeatedly voted for the current president. Um, we were wondering if, um, if you see uh, a significant difference between the current generation and the older generation. Uh, you know, um, you mean I, I write in my Minsk diary or uh, in my Minsk diary? I think in my uh, okay. European poem. Yeah. Ah, uh, in my European poem. You know, I changed, uh, I put out that part about my parents from a uh, later version of my European poem. Uh, so I changed it because uh, it turned out that uh, uh, on the day of elections, it was not like I imagined because uh, my parents were also for changes, it turned out, and they supported uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska. Uh, that's why maybe it's not true. And uh, of course, now uh, with my brother being imprisoned, it's completely changed. So it's not that. And uh, I wouldn't say that we have that uh, uh, this uh, generation gap uh, concerning political views or something. Uh, it's it's uh, the line, the dividing line is uh, uh, somewhere else. It's it's about values, but it's not about your age. Uh, uh, in in Belarus, in Minsk, uh, in 2020, we had so-called uh, uh, demonstrations or marches of elderly people that took to the streets, and they were mostly elderly women uh, that were protesting the violence of the state. So it's not about age at all, I think. It's about values that you have, whether you are uh, a part of that corrupt system or not. And if you are not, you can't just uh, approve of that brutality towards, uh, towards common people as uh, more than 35,000 of people uh, have been arrested, uh, have been imprisoned on administrative or uh, criminal charges, and any any person who is uh, uh, see who more or less, let's say, clever. I don't know. Uh, see, it's not normal. This kind of situation, right? But of course, these maybe elderly people. They are not. Uh, they were raised and they lived their life, uh, most of their life in the Soviet Union, when it was a us usual practice to keep silent, uh, not to raise their words, not to speak up, uh, to hide their views, to speak about all the things only at their small kitchens. Uh, 
maybe that's uh, also um, the problem, but still they do not support the state, I wouldn't say so. Okay, thank you. Um, so far, I can't see any questions from the audience, or uh, please, uh, if the technical support can tell me if there are any, um, I would be happy, but I'm also happy to ask you further questions, <laughs> because for me, um, I mean, sitting in Berlin and being German and growing up with the system here, whenever I hear stories of like revolutionary stories or other countries where I see there's oppression and like, you know, we get a lot of media reports on like things are, ha there are so many terrible things happening all over the world. And then you have the situation here in Germany where also nationalism, there's like, you know, uh, right wing populism and it's getting more and more normal, like it's, there's a sense of normalization of nationalism, obviously also uh, on a global scale. Um, in a way, of course, me living here, it makes me angry, but I wonder, like from a perspective of coming from a revolutionary context and from an, oppress uh, from an oppressive context, then going to a country like also Austria, but even also the context in Germany, um, do you does it anger you when people take the situation there in for granted, or does it make you hopeful that it is possible to have a democratic um, society? Or what kind of emotions does it spark within you? Uh. Of course, it's not anger. <laughs> I can't be angry with these people. It's maybe it's normal uh, uh, to, to take situation for granted. But of course, I think uh, one of the lessons that people can learn from the situation in Belarus that you should not take all uh, democracy for granted. Uh, and we see it's not only in Germany. Maybe in Germany it's it's better. But uh, we see the situation in Hungary, or we see. Uh, the situation in Poland, for example, both these countries are uh, the EU, uh, EU uh, states. And uh, um, I think uh, it, democracy is something you should always work for. You, sh you should always uh, remember that uh, it can uh, just uh, go away if you if you do not pay uh, enough attention to uh, to these t uh, to those who are in power because uh, power can uh, corrupt people and uh, uh, we see that in Belarus we see that in other countries and uh, you have to be uh, if not active, because you can't be active all the time, of course, uh, we are not made for uh, <laughs> uh, being political all of our last, not made for being uh, politically active, but you should uh, still keep in mind that it's not uh, um, so simple, that it can change if you just uh, uh, take your eyes from... Uh, what is going on in your own country? If, if you are too passive, or you think you you are out of politics, then it will come to your family. It can be in long perspective, maybe in short one, but yeah. But it's still, uh, I but it's still, I'm uh, very thankful to uh, countries like Germany or countries like Austria or even Poland, uh, though maybe yeah. Uh, that they pay attention to what is going in uh, going on in Belarus, and they try to support. Uh, they try to, and they do uh, show their solidarity uh, to Belarusian people who had to leave their country because of political uh, reasons. And still, uh, yeah. So I'm very thankful also. In that context, how um, important is it for you to, I mean, you also uh, work a lot together with your husband, how important is it for you um, to have like con uh, a connection to the diaspora? Because from what I understand also, um, 
living outside of your country or living in exile always comes with the feeling of guilt and the feeling of leaving other people behind. Um, what does it mean to to have other people who are also in exile and how how is that i mean for you maybe you can say a few words about that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know uh, exile uh now in uh, 2021 and exile uh, uh even 20 years ago these are very uh different things so uh I'm reading Belarusian news all the time, so we, I read uh, even more Telegram channels that I used to read uh, uh, when I was in Belarus. So it, it's at the moment it's much more important for me, and of course it's not much important, but it's very important for me. So I, I want to be, uh, I want to know, I want to be aware of the situation all the time, as I'm also taking part in many international events, and I have to speak about the situation in Belarus. So I should uh, be in the context of that. And uh, I also uh, can contact my parents uh, through uh, different uh, social media platforms. So, and we talk to each other almost every day. So I, I know it is. But if you speak about guilt, so I, I felt that guilt maybe in the first months. So in 2020 at the, and in January maybe. But at the moment I see that... Um, very many people left the country and uh, uh, very many people uh, still plan to leave the country. So I try to, so um, I try not to feel that killed, but to do something. So to speak about that situation, I think that's more important. And uh, the situation with my brother, uh, who couldn't leave the country, though he wanted to, shows that sometimes it's too late and i feel uh, um, not guilty maybe but i'm afraid uh, i feel afraid for those who are inside the, and we have a lot of talks now in the social media uh, about that uh, because there are some people who that just decided that that's their that they want to stay they know that they can be taken to prison uh every minute so uh in the morning they can come for them they can just broke into their house uh take their things and take them uh, and uh, their children could be alone all the things but they still decided to stay and i decided but maybe they do not they can't speak so openly and i decided that i if i'm here if i'm um uh, in a safe place, I should speak and use my voice if I do not have that threat. Yeah, so that's my way of uh, uh, coping with that. But also, uh, um, 2020 changed a lot in the life of Belarusian diaspora. Uh, so before that, people were even a bit of a sh a bit of ashamed of uh, naming uh, the the their uh, their country of origin they didn't want to say that they were belarusians even sometimes they said they were from russia or from ukraine or something like that but not belarusian but uh now it's they they are proud to say that they are from belarus and they are proud to tell about their country and they organize they unite together they uh raise money um, for uh, for the repressed, for uh, political prisoners. And uh, it's also very important, I think, for those who are inside of Belarus as well. And of course, they speak a lot about the situation. They speak to the European politicians, to the world politicians. And it's an important thing that they do. And I'm also kind of uh, a part of diaspora, of course, now. Yes. Julia, thank you so much um, for sharing you, your insight, for sharing your words, um, and for your perspective. Um, I have more time, to <laughs> but like I said before the session already, um, we have to like try to to keep to the schedule, um, and unfortunately, our time is over already. Um, I would like to now introduce the audience to another woman um, who is 
fought democratization in a very different context, in a different manner. Um, Mairead McEntee, we are very, very glad to have you. I hope that you can now hear us and that the technical situation is good. Um, welcome you very warmly. And you were part of the Citizens' Assembly on the 8th Amendment in Ireland. And um, we are very curious here on that process that basically legalized abortion in your country. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I would like to give you the floor or, or hand you over the virtual mic. Thank you. Before I start, can I just say how impressed Julia has made me feel and made me feel so inadequate that I'm here sitting in Ireland and we have had our own troubles, as you know, and I just feel very fortunate and I feel so sorry for you and I wish I could do something, but perhaps, I don't know, we have a peace process. We say in Ireland, lacoon of day, which means please God, it will continue at the moment. It's a little bit dubious, but at least we didn't have to flee our country. And I think you're wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I can only agree to that. Now, you. the Citizens' Assembly. It was decided by the previous government to hold a Citizens' Assembly. They, have, they had six topics to discuss, but the main one was the Eighth Amendment, which was the abortion one. And... <clears throat> None of the political parties wanted to bring in abortion. They were afraid they would lose their voters. So the way around this is a typical Irish solution to an Irish problem. They passed it on. And they did that by starting a citizens' assembly. Now, we were given different topics, but the first one, the main one, was the to amend the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. Under our law, the Constitution cannot be changed without uh, an overwhelming vote by the people of Ireland. It has to be a majority. So we started. We were uh, The inaugural one was in October. And how they chose the citizens was a very good way. It was a random selection by uh, a polling company. And to qualify, you had to have voted in previous referendum. And I was in my own kitchen, minding my own business one day, making chutneys because I had a daughter getting married in a month's time and she wanted chutneys made for her wedding cheesecake. And the lady came and she asked me, first of all, was I a member of a political party? And I said, no. Was I a member of any pressure group involved with abortion? And again, no. So she said, I think you might be suitable. So eventually, <clears throat> it was followed up with telephone interviews, and 99 of us were chosen from all around Ireland. <clears throat> and we were supposed to meet just for a year, every weekend or every second weekend. But the discussion on the 8th went on for five months, each weekend for five months. Now, we had people speaking, professional people, doctors, lawyers, nurses, ordinary people who told their own experiences both for and against abortion. We had to read so many different papers and we came to the conclusion that yes, the law had to be changed here. It was a terrible case whereby a 29-year-old woman was technically dead but because she couldn't, because they had a heartbeat from the baby they couldn't remove her life support machine. And they had to go to our Supreme Court to have permission <clears throat> to have their daughter uh, taken off life support. And I think that made us all realize the awful things that can happen to people that you don't think about and you don't know about. However, the overall 68%, 67% of the assembly voted in favor of removing the eight. And the interesting thing is by law then, it had to go to the people. 
and the what we passed at the Citizens' Assembly, the 99 of us, reflected completely in the result of the referendum that was put to the Irish people. And out of the 40 constituencies in Ireland, the voting constituencies, 39 voted in favour and only one constituency voted against it. So it was a very successful um, assembly from that point of view. Now, during our deliberations and during all the, the months we spent, we had Garda protection at the hotel, Garda is uh, in English, police protection at the hotel, because there were very, very strong demonstrations against us and what we were doing. We were called terrible things, even though we hadn't passed any judgment at that stage, we were just listening. We were called baby killers, we were called mur murderers, we were told this, that and the other. And <clears throat> it wasn't very pleasant going into the hotel and in the end, the, the, guard, the police moved and stopped the protesters coming onto the grounds of the hotel. The other things then that we debated were how Ireland can cope and help with the ageing population. The other one we debated was climate change. Now climate change was to be given just one weekend and the members of the assembly felt this wasn't right. So we voted to have a second weekend which was granted to us because climate change is such a big issue. So that was allowed. Another one we had to talk about was how referenda are held and should, they, should it be changed. And the last one was fixed term parliaments. But the main one was the eighth and it was enlightening. And it just brought me, I was again thinking to Julia, how individuals can change a government if the government will listen to you. And we got the politicians off the hook here because it was our recommendations. So they didn't have to worry about losing votes. They said, you know, the Citizens Assembly decided this, we've got clean hands. Even though most of them, the party, the main parties came out in, in favour and they gave a free vote and it, it was passed. And it's the power of people. We have democracy, which we have to guard so carefully, but people can also be listened to. The way the assembly was brought about was people want to change. Women, men want to change. We felt our rule was archaic that people, women could die having a baby because the doctors could not save the woman's life because the baby was viable, even though the chances perhaps of the baby surviving were still very slim, if at all. So I believe, and I can't stress enough the importance of democracy, but also the importance of people, ordinary people making their voices heard. And if we shout loud enough, eventually we will be heard. And we will be heard in our own country. It may take a while, but it, we will be heard. And then universally, perhaps if other countries might look at what we've had as Citizens Assembly, they can make their voices heard. Now, going back to Belarus, I, my heart goes out to you. I don't know what can be done. We lived, in Ireland, we understate things. We didn't have a civil war here, we called it the Troubles. But we have a peace process that is hanging on a knife's edge at the moment. But, you know, it's, it's just, it's a horrible situation. But I believe in power for the people and I believe in democracy. And I feel if people are listened to, democracy and people power can go hand in hand and to guard our democracy with our lives because it is so important and there are so many different groups now who are trying to undermine democracy and it's very very important that we can control and keep our democracies in the countries that have it and try and help the countries that don't. I speak to you passionately about this. I mean I'm an old woman so what happens isn't going to affect me, but it's going to affect you, it's going to affect your grandchildren and their children. So please, 
Do what you can to protect your democracy. Do what you can to get people's voices listened to. It's so important. Thank you, Mairead, for this very passionate Thank note you. on democracy. I sort of wandered a bit, but I speak from my heart. Mireille, when, when you speak so passionately about democracy um, and the process of how you got involved um, uh, in, in democracy in general, the one question I had and I really wanted to ask you uh, when knowing that I would get the chance to talk to you is, did you consider yourself a political person before all of this? No. No. Do you consider yourself a political person now? Yes, but I won't join a party because I feel being not in a party, I have the power. Yes. And is there anything that you have to say to people that might still not feel like a political person? That, sorry, my husband distracted me. <laughs> what was your question? My question is, do you have anything to say to people that don't consider themselves political? Well, even if one doesn't consider themselves political, they should still vote. It's very important. And go back to Belarus. Those people, the way they're being treated is inhumane. And I don't care whether the government thinks it's the elected government or not. It's a humane way of treating people. And I think as a society, I don't know what I can do except ask Julia to send me through you a copy of her poem, which I will send to President Higgins, the President of Ireland, who's also a poet, and he's a peacemaker. And I promise you I will do that. But I don't know. Sometimes I just say, cheapest, does the dog listen to me more than other things, you know? But I am a Democrat, through and through, in that I believe in democracy. And I believe that people should never, ever, ever be squashed and walked underfoot. Regard regardless of their religion or their views, they should not be. It's so important. And it worries me at the moment the way the world is going. You know, look at the USA, for example, where you have a man who doesn't admit defeat. You know, look at what's happened in Belarus. Look what's happening in other countries. So that's all I can say. I am passionate about being allowed to use my voice and I feel very privileged that I could be part of this Citizens' Assembly, which was so well run. And yes, am I going on too much? <laughs> yeah, I think we have some questions now from the audience that I would like to uh, bring forward. Um, they actually fit well with what you just said. Um, because one question is, did you need time to think um, on whether you wanted to join the assembly or um, was it an immediate decision? You knew straight away no. you wanted to be part. No, I was asked would I be interested. And then I had certain criteria that she asked me. And she said to me, I will forward your name, but there could be other people in different parts of the country that meet the age group, the social group, whatever. And then I got a phone call from uh, the secretariat, which was the Taoiseach, the Taoiseach, the prime minister's office. And they asked me more questions and they kept saying, are you sure? So I, I didn't have to make an instant decision at all. And in fact, after our inaugural meeting, which was in Dublin Castle in October 2016, I think six people dropped out. They decided they didn't want to continue. So there was no pressure ever. Yeah, but I mean more for you personally. Um, was it um, not whether people pressured more? For you personally, was it clear from the beginning that you wanted to be part of the process or were you a bit skeptical in the beginning, especially because you said you didn't consider yourself as political? No, when I when I when when things were explained more to me, yes, definitely I wanted to be a member. And I, in fact, I would have been disappointed had I not been picked. 
Okay, great. Another question from the audience is how your friends and family reacted to your experience and your process. Oh, I'm a coward. I only told my immediate family and my very close friends and I don't, as you know, I don't do social media. I'm a Luddite. Um, so I didn't tell them because I didn't want them to try and persuade me. And the family know me enough to say, we won't say a word, let her get on with it. Because I had homework <laughs> to do. You know, people, mm -hmm. members of the public would make submissions and we read, well, for the one on the 8th, there was over 1300 submissions, which we couldn't obviously read them all. But we had homework to do from the different medicals, the different lawyers, um, different action groups, both pro and anti that we had to familiarize ourselves with. So that kept me quiet and out of my children's hair for a while. And um, did it change the, like, because I, I guess at some point, uh, your families and friends, they, they knew that you were involved. Um, maybe also you can share a bit of their reactions towards that and also whether it changed the kind of conversations you had at home and with friends and maybe did you also see a shift there from people being less political but then you being involved them getting more political how do you how would you say well first of all they didn't know how I voted we all had a vote and it was a closed ballot so I wouldn't know how you voted if you were sitting beside me so no one knew how I voted. <clears throat> now I, <clears throat> excuse me, I had two personal attacks on me <clears throat> after the assembly because unfortunately, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'm talking too much. I was seen on television one day, just going into the meeting and now, other people whom I know saw me, but they said nothing. But these two people, one day in the supermarket, a man attacked me and called me a murderess. And I said to him, you're entitled to your view, but you don't know how I voted. And another one said to me, how dare you say hello to me? You're an abortionist. And I said, sure, well then, I don't need to say hello to you. But that was, they were the only two difficult ones I got. And in general, I mean, maybe, I mean, the threats, of course, is a very extreme um, context, but in, in like, just maybe in general with disagreements, how did you, how did you deal with that? Um, and would you say that the, um, did you feel that the discourse led you to a better understanding of others' perspectives in general? That is also a question from the audience. Oh, absolutely. It did. Um, like, I went in and I had an open mind regarding the Eighth Amendment. I didn't know how I would vote or how, you know, what, what it was going to be. I didn't realize it was going to be as involved and it had to be, it had to go on for the five weekends because if, if there was so much to take in, I felt at the end of it, I had learned a lot. And I felt I had a better perspective from both points of view. And I came to the conclusion that with very few, in very few cases, abortion is not an easy option for, for people. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why abortion is needed and there's also all sorts of reasons why perhaps it isn't needed now we're allowed abortion here up to 12 weeks without any questions and after 12 weeks if there's a threat to the mother's life or that there is a fetal abnormality it can be carried out have i answered the question i think so yes <laughs> Um, parallelly, I, there's a lot of questions flooding in now. <laughs> I'm trying to keep track. We have another nine minutes. Um, so 
there is one uh, which one question uh, says did the experience of being under public pressure and even threatened make you feel different about politicians who might experience hate speech and aggression a lot I think it I don't uh, like goes towards like did you empathize with them or how did you I don't mind politicians being under pressure answering questions in the door in the in the parliament or on radio or television programs but they certainly nobody has the right to attack their houses and their families as has been happening here in recent weeks definitely not and if i met a politician in the street um and they said i say hello to them and i'd say can you please do something about climate change or can you please do something about whatever but i certainly not to attack them i'm a pacifist at heart no i think that was i think nobody was making that assumption <laughs> that you would attack politicians i think the question was more um how do you, has it changed your perspective on politicians like because politicians receive threats when they have very progressive approaches of politics for example like similar to what you have experienced so did that did that make you empathize more with politicians did you maybe also have a different view on politics in general through your experience of how extreme the reactions can be to progressive policies i can understand how the reactions can be extreme um and sometimes very rarely but sometimes i do feel sorry for politicians because they have to bring in acts that we don't want but it's for the greater good if you know what i mean it's not might not be what i'd like um or what you'd like but it's for the greater good and they have to make this decision they also have to keep looking over their shoulder because in five years to before their own electorate again and they have to keep Mairead McEntee happy and they have to keep whoever down in Kerry happy in their own constituencies so it's hard for them at times to balance both but I still think if they're acting for the common good yes I can understand it if they're acting just for parochial reasons no and i have another question um i was wondering like in this whole process um do you think that i mean from your feeling and from from what you saw in media and like the general way how you perceive the irish society do you think that the assembly changed the way how people perceive democracy in your country no Oh, how do they or did they? I don't know is the answer. I don't know. Um, I honestly don't know. Some people... It's also a difficult <laughs> question because, yeah. Sorry. Like to me, my vote's important to me and I don't want to ever, ever live in a country that takes that away. But what does annoy me is when we have elections be they general or presidential, or to vote in a referenda, the number of people who don't vote. And that really, really makes me angry. And they're the ones who complain most. Because if you don't use your voice, you can't give your opinion. Right. Mm, I also have another question regarding the assembly. <laughs> Um, and the way how it was picked out and everything. I was wondering, um, because it has been such a, a positive outcome and such a positive experience also for you personally, I was wondering, how do you view um, in democracies in general? Because democracies are so closely linked uh, to, a, to an election process, and I think we are all convinced that that is really important. Um, but in your situation, no election on um, the people for the assembly being picked. So do you have any thoughts on that? And maybe and Julia, you might also have thoughts on that. I was wondering because I think that's, that's a very thing 
crossroad of your two stories because voting is so essential and is such is something in Belarus that is so um, with so much strength was tried to be enforced that it that it's fair and everything. But then other story um, which is to to voting an election at all. So I was just wondering, maybe as the last question, because we only have three and a half minutes left, um, maybe the two of you have a few thoughts um, on that. I have one quick one, very quick. Mm -hmm. At the assembly, when we met each month, we were never at the same table and we had a moderator at the table. So I couldn't sit with the two of you each month. There were all different people with me. So we couldn't be persuaded by crowds how we were going to vote or how we were thinking of things. And when we had a speaker, after he'd spoken or she had spoken, we were allowed to ask a question, but we didn't have a right of reply. So I would ask Julia from Belarus a question. And if I didn't agree with it or I wanted further clarification, I had to keep my mouth shut. And that's the way it was run. Our judge, we had a, a retired Supreme Court judge was our chairwoman. And she would have the casting vote. And she ran it like a dictator. We had to be sitting down ready at nine o'clock each morning. And we had to do what we were told. So a benign dictator, maybe. Thank you, Julia. Do you have, I think you're muted. Sorry, was it a question for me or uh, you mean this about vote or from? Uh, I mean, I think it would be really interesting to hear your perspective, yes, because voting is such an essential part of the Belarusian story and it's in yeah. such a stark yeah. contrast to another, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's very interesting, it has been very interesting for me to to listen to uh, my read story about this voting because, you know, uh, I've never participated in uh, the uh, uh, in the elections that were not falsificated. So actually, I don't know what it is to uh, for the elections not to be falsificated. Um, first time I took part in my uh, in the elections was 2001, and when I was 18 then, that was my first elections. And this time it was the second time, 2020. Both and all the uh, all the elections between them uh, were uh, rigged. Uh, and I know that for sure. I was the witness to that in my 18, so I didn't have any um, uh, illusions, or I didn't want to have that illusions. But that's true. I think that voting is one of the most important parts. And in Belarus, we wanted to believe that, that this uh, voting can help us. And during the elections, uh, uh, Mary was speaking about people who didn't, who were reluctant to uh, vote during uh, presidential election 2020. There were long lines of people standing to vote. I don't know whether you can uh, uh, believe that or not. There were all, uh, several dozens of people uh, standing to give uh, their opinion on what was going on and to vote against Lukashenko for Svetlana Tikhanovskaya for someone else. And uh, it showed how, uh, how important for us it was. But then, uh, then uh, in, my essay, in the essays, uh, uh, one of these, um, in, in, the, in the diary, I wrote, when they take your vote, use your voice. But, uh, and I meant protests. But then, uh, actually, it didn't help. Uh, it didn't help even to, to be there in the streets, unfortunately. And if you are uh, so-called leaders, uh, tyrants, these dictators don't want uh, to hear you, then uh, nothing, nothing will change as well. So they should be just put away, and that's it. So they should go away and only... After that, we can build democracy, maybe. I wish we could uh, continue this conversation for a much longer time, I really have to say. Um, 
But unfortunately, I have to be strict about the, the time. Um, it was so, so lovely uh, talking to the two of you. Thank you so much for participating in this format and for giving us such different perspectives um, and very personal perspectives on the process of democratization. Um, for our audience, I can say the next session will be in half an hour. Um, it will be a session on the democratization of Europe. Um, and so we have half an hour of a, of a pause. Um, tomorrow, um, we'll have another format, which is similar to the, um, I mean, the same format as we had today, um, with three other very interesting speakers, two performers, um, and it will be offline. And I hope that we'll have a big audience for that as well, because it has really been a great joy um, to, to talk in such a personal uh, manner about democratization. And yeah, once again, thank you to our two speakers today. Um, I wish both of you the very best in all the ways that you're pushing forward democracy. And it has really been a pleasure for me to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. And Julia, Thank don't you. forget to send your poem. Ask Julia to remember to send the poem to you so I can send okay. it to you. Please. Thank you, Irene. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gita, for your moderation.